Andy, thanks for being here. My pleasure. You've been involved with NATO for many, many decades <laughs> in many capacities. There were periods in there, you know, even a decade ago when it wasn't the most exciting organization with the most compelling mission. These days, <laughs> it seems to be hopping again. What's going on with NATO? <laughs> Well, NATO is a pretty busy place these days. Uh, I've been there for almost four years as the Deputy Sec Gen, and it was kind of dull the first two years, but thanks to uh, Russia, plus the meltdown of the countries to our south, we have more than enough to do. It kind of recalls for me a more happy period when I first served at NATO in the early 90s when we were dealing with the consequences of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the opening up of Europe and bringing not only Central Europe but Russia into our family as partners, and eventually some of them became members. Sadly, some of that uh, hasn't worked out as well as we uh, would like. And uh, talking about Russia as a partner seems, at best, a very distant proposition. Does NATO have one mission or many, and has that remission remained constant over time? Well, the basic mission of NATO has remained constant. That's the collective defense of our members. Uh, an attack on one is an attack on all. But we've taken on additional missions over the years. Uh, in the 90s, we started to do crisis management with the interventions in Bosnia and later in Kosovo. We also established this uh, global network of partners where we're trying to kind of export security and stability by helping uh, other countries strengthen their own capacity and, uh, and become contributors to the international system. All those missions continue, but uh, collective defense has gone back to being uh, job number one, thanks to uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Now, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, Ukraine was not a member of NATO, is not a member of NATO, mm -hmm. so, and it doesn't have the Article 5 security guarantee that mm -hmm. NATO members have. So why have so many people been so worried that Ukraine will be followed up with some kind of Russian move against an actual NATO member? Well, unfortunately for Ukraine, as you said, they don't benefit from the artif Article 5 guarantee. And so we've had to put other forms of pressure on Russia to try to impose costs for its uh, aggression. But we have to look at what the Russians did in Ukraine and reckon with at least the possibility, maybe a remote possibility, but it's a real possibility that they could uh, engage in the sort of hybrid attacks that they used, especially with the annexation of Crimea. So we have to ensure that our, our members are more resilient, that they're less vulnerable to the sorts of subversion and uh, covert uh, meddling that the Russians carried out in Ukraine. And we have to ensure that the alliance can deliver on the Article 5 pledge, that we can get forces there to defend them quickly. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do since our big summit meeting uh, last September in, in Wales. So the danger is no longer tanks coming through the Fulda Gap, it's little green men showing up in Estonia or someplace like that. Indeed. I mean, it may be a remote possibility. I don't think Russia is looking for a direct conflict with NATO. Uh, we don't think the, the threat of aggression is, uh, is immediate or imminent. But given the uh, willingness to tear up the international rule book that Putin has displayed in Ukraine, and given the fact that uh, he talks about the breakup of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, greater than the Holocaust or other you know, minor events like that, uh, we have to at least be, be prepared for the possibility that uh, our expectations are wrong. How would you describe how NATO has responded to the entire Ukraine crisis? Mm -hmm. Well, of course. I work for NATO, I would say the response has been just right. But it's, it's a difficult challenge because Ukraine isn't a member, but they deserve to be respected as a sovereign state. So we've tried to help them, but not to pour oil on the fire. Uh, we've provided them some assistance to their defense uh, reforms. We've set up some trust funds to help them improve their capacities, like in command and control, logistics. We're not directly encouraging them to seek a military solution, because there is no military solution. Is time on the side of NATO or its opponents? I think time is on the side of NATO. I mean, we have work to do to actually deliver on all the pledges we've made to strengthen our defenses. Nations need to start spending more on defense. But in, a, in an era of globalization, Russia is sooner or later going to realize that isolation from the international community will leave Russia behind, and they will be uh, if not on the dustbin of history, at least uh, more and more marginalized in world affairs. So their involvement in a, in a new theater such as Syria is something that they're going to re end up regretting and it's our job not to stay, <laughs> not, to, not to get in the way of them screwing up? <laughs> well, uh, I think they may find themselves in over their heads in Syria, but we can't be complacent. I mean, they're clearly trying to defeat 
the moderate opposition. They're not countering ISIL. They're not targeting ISIL so far, at least. And so uh, there may be some uh, strengthening of the Assad regime, which it seems to be their main agenda. But over time, I think they're, they're going to find that they're turning the whole Sunni world against Russia by lining up with the uh, sort of the Shiite axis. And I think they're going to find that uh, as casualties begin to mount for their forces, uh, that this may not be such a, a winner for, for Russia or for President Putin personally. You began your career in one Cold War. Are you going <laughs> to end your career in another <laughs> Cold War? Well, it kind of looks that way on the surface, but because uh, my career isn't over yet, uh, I do hope that we can come up with an effective response to Russia so that we avoid another Cold War. I mean, there are so many areas where we should be able to cooperate with Russia. In the last uh, 20, 25 years, show that, that cooperation is possible. I mean, people forget that we had Russian forces operating under NATO command in Bosnia and later in Kosovo. Uh, we've worked together on fighting terrorism and dealing with hijacked aircraft. Uh, so it's not foreordained that we're forever doomed to this sort of tense relationship. But unfortunately, the present leadership in Russia seems to want NATO to be an adversary. I think it's part of their their strategy for maintaining control at home and for uh, exerting hegemony in their uh, neighborhood. So we have to have strategic patience, make clear that partnership is where we'd like to return to, but not uh, by compromising our principles. Some people have argued that NATO helped provoke the, European, the Ukraine crisis by uh, holding out the prospect of uh, eventual uh, NATO expansion to Ukraine, uh, peeling off some of uh, core Moscow's uh, mm -hmm. clients. Uh, do you buy any of that? Well, I can't deny that the Russians attach special importance to Ukraine and to the other uh, neighbors that were in the Soviet Union, such as Georgia. And so they've never liked NATO enlargement, uh, although I would maintain, to the, as I've said when it first started, that ultimately it's good for Russian security to actually have stable neighbors who are part of a collective security and defense system who don't have border uh, disputes with their neighbors who are interested in mutually beneficial trade and economic development. Russia, however, seems to like weak, unstable uh, neighbors. That, that, that seems to be their formula for security for Russia, which is uh, simply not an acceptable way to, way to proceed. We're in the midst of yet another presidential campaign in the U.S. right now. Uh, you hear in the U.S. discussion of foreign policy, there's for always a discussion about my opponent did this horrible thing, <laughs> I'm going to do this great thing, and it's almost a portrayal of exaggerated change from administration to administration, mm -hmm. party to party. You've been around the block several yeah. times, you're now Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, is American foreign policy and the policy of an organization such as NATO far more constant over time than you would get the sense of just reading the pol politicians' statements? I think basically yes. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. yes. Uh, I've been around uh, since uh, my first job in the Foreign Service with the, during the Carter administration, so I, I date myself. And I think that, you know, there have been many transatlantic differences, but uh, kind of the commitment to NATO and to European security has always been a constant from one administration to the next. But some problems have been constants as well, the whole burden sharing issue. It's, it's never going to be maybe solved, but it's gotten worse in the last decade. Since 9-11, the proportion of NATO defense spending shouldered by the United States has risen to over 70 percent of the total, and that's just not healthy. Uh, and while Europeans are beginning to recognize that they, they can't keep cutting, and a few of them are starting to increase, uh, that burden sharing issue could become uh, a real challenge if we continue to have our own domestic uh, financial and political uh, challenges as well. Is that the biggest takeaway that the Europeans need to understand? They need to up their game more to hold up their end of the bargain? It is, although they've been hearing that for decades and somehow the problem hasn't uh, gotten better, it's gotten worse. But you know, I always as an optimist think that this time will be different. <laughs> What's the biggest thing that American audiences need to understand that they don't fully appreciate? I think they understand that even though there may be these concerns about the Europeans not always pulling their weight. Uh, that they, they do a lot for us, that NATO is uh, in some ways a bargain for the United States in terms of the capacity that we can tap into when we have a security problem that, uh, that we need to solve and that to solve on our own would be 
both too risky and, and too expensive. So this is an enormous asset for the United States. And as we go into a period of, uh, of rising threats, rising uncertainty, uh, rising instability everywhere you look, uh, much better to have allies than not. You mentioned rising threats, rising uh, instability, rising turbulence. That's what the papers are filled with. That's what everybody always says. Yeah. But you mentioned that you began your career in the Carter administration. Mm -hmm. You lived through the Reagan years. You lived through lots of turmoil after and insecurity and uncertainty. Do you feel like the world is more dangerous and threatening now than it was back then, or that we are still dramatically more secure now than, than we were uh, even just a few mm -hmm. short decades ago? Yeah. Well, I, my kind of instinctive answer is that it is more dangerous. I, I just can't re recall threats of this scale and proportion during my career. And I've been a student of uh, Soviet affairs over the years, so I, I kind of, not through direct experience, but through my studies, know what it was like. And I think not since the, sort of the, the time when Stalin was still alive was the relationship quite as unpredictable as it is now with Russia. I mean, Brezhnev, once he consolidated power in particular became a status quo power. The whole Hels Helsinki Final Act was something Russia wanted desperately to basically freeze the results of World War II. Now we're dealing with a leadership that is ready to overturn the status quo, wants to revise the whole post-Cold War settlement and even some of the principles of the post-World War II settlement. So that for me is very formidable. When you add that to this Islamic State and all the other terrorist movements and the weakness of the states around us. Uh, the authoritarians may, may have fallen, but democracy has not taken its place with, with only a few notable exceptions. So it is a much more dangerous neighborhood for, for Europe, and continued U.S. leadership and engagement is indispensable if we're going to get a handle on it. A not entirely reassuring uh, <laughs> talk. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador uh, Sandy Birchbaugh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.